Introducción. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for coming and listening to me. The idea is to start discussing the other crops that we include in our rotations. We call them cover crops, but the idea we have in the group and in APRESID is to call them service crop for, because they do much more than just cover the soil. They provide many other services. So Juan Diaz and Calegari will explain all the benefits that these crops may provide. And I will start thinking about what rotation I can have to get these services. It's a change of paradigm. Create the rotation based on the services we need. So we are going to discuss different things that we only realize we need them when we lose them. So many things in the systems, we don't have them anymore. And now that we've lost them, we are valuing them again. When we will start, we will try to explain these new crops. So Juan Diaz is an agronomist. He is a manager of the research area of PGG in South America. Juan Diaz, a PhD that will be delivering his presentation. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, be able to tell you what's going on in Uruguay. My presentation reflects uh, the work by many. And as you will see, it includes the academia, producers, APRESID, etc. I'm going to deliver it, but it is a joint effort. I thought it was important to show you this graph, which provides a context to what we're going to discuss in 20 minutes. If we see the graph, we can see that uh, last century the soybean acreage in Uruguay was very little. If we add uh, the other um, crops, well, we said that soybean was Argentina, Uruguay was sunflower. And this is something that we have to challenge because now we say, why didn't we start soybean before? So we moved from a very little acreage to a very large acreage. Soybean is the dominant crop in Uruguay. Why? It is the one that makes money there, and production systems have changed. Behind this curve is, of course, no-till that started with Ausid, Apresid, 10 years before. This is the 25th conference, but in the first conferences, we would come to believe this was possible, that this was a possibility. So this expansion this was under no deal, and this is something we don't discuss anymore. We come here to discuss other things, not to say or to discuss whether no till is the way to go or not. Because yesterday, when we discussed conservation agriculture in other parts of the world, that is not, this is not true in other parts of the world. Here we are trying to transform the system, but not to discuss the core principle. If we go through the three pillars of the previous presentation, of course, we know that behind this we have our Roundup Ready soybean. We have uh, certain specific uh, things that and knowledge that people from Argentina went to Uruguay to teach us. We would use no teal for two or three years, and then we would go to 
um, cover crops, but the introduction of uh, no-till allowed us to extend the agricultural part of the cycle. So from nothing to 1.5 million, we transformed agriculture. And as we accumulated no-till years, we started finding different problems. This other graph shows that uh, it was not only soybean. Uh, Uruguay also was uh, producing these other crops. The first bar, brown and green, includes summer crops, but soybean is 90%, sorghum and corn a little bit, and on the right, winter crops. Uh, wheat, barley, some colza, and you see that uh, last decade there were more co summer crops, and since 2011 or 2012, summer crops is twice as much as winter crop. So when we talk about service crops, we talk about winter crops, because that's where we have the opportunity. I include that little arrow. That is when we started implemented compulsory management plans. Some of you already know, but ever since the 2012-2013 growing season, the arable land in Uruguay should include or send this information to an online system and has to comply with a certain erosion limit. And this is through rotation. We will discuss now cover crops and how this changed as we introduced and we discuss how to come with better rotation. So we have this amount of hectares that are available under summer stubble. A very tempting conclusion is that everything with service crops in Uruguay had to do with use plans. But though they were important, things were done before those plans were implemented. Here we see the predecessor of summer crops, first summer crops, along the growing seasons before the plants were compulsory. You can see that 2010-2011, this was just very little, and the last campaign before the implementation of these plants was required, 60% of the area of these uh, producers that we call avant-garde producers was already with uh, a predecessor of service crop. This graph shows the entire country, not only the CREA farmers. It shows what happened with the area that has no more summer crops. We had a survey and we estimated what does the area that has no more summer crops do. Here we have the blue bars service crops, it's the green part of the bar, and the blue is winter crops, the green is service crops, and the other is fallow. The graph in the end shows that one year before the implementation of the plans, there was 270,000 hectares with service crops. And obviously, this number increased with more, with the different growing seasons. So, with no winter crops, we have service crops and fallow. So, we see that from 50 50, we come up with one third that is not planted in the winter. And our problem is how to integrate this. So what I'm showing you here is two things. First, summer crops are apart because summer crops were a single block, but now we have three 
different things to explain summer crops. So, first soybean, second soybean, and maize plus sorghum. So the first graph shows the service crops acreage planted on the stubble from these three options. And we see that most of this area is on soybean because it is the dominant crop and the one that arises the most concerns in us. This is, of course, okay for first soybean. So first soybean and second soybean represent 90% and service crops are very little in the area because we have more stubble. So why is this graph important? Because we're going to discuss what we are planting in Uruguay and why. And when we talk about service crops, what we suggest is different in Uruguay to what Ademir can discuss for Brazil because the systems are different, resources are different, crops are combined in a different fashion. This provides us with an opportunity window. That window for us is soybean, somewhere between April to mid-September when we dry again to plant summer crops. That's our window. The second graph shows the percentage of summer crops acreage that are not cropped again. 80% of the maize and sorghum area, which is what we expected in soybean, we've improved a lot because we've moved from 30% for soybean, that is our biggest concern, and we've come down 30% to 18. So if we ask where to place our concern, it's here in that 18% of first soybean that has no cover crops. So when we monitor, we will see what happens with land use plans. But let's go one step ahead. What are we planting? We have a survey and we assess these. We ask farmers, what are you going to plant after soybean, maize, or sorghum? He tells us whether it's going to be wheat, oats, or cover crops. And if it is a service crop, this is the information we have. So we see that the year before implementing the land use plans, there were about 300,000 hectares of service crop, and it was basically rye grass. We have increased cover crops acreage, and rye grass is not so significant anymore, and now it is dominated by oats, estrigosa or white oats. The other crops um, are still a very little amount, less than 10%. So we have to understand why. So let's change our focus and let's try to understand what we want so that we can discuss other options. The panel is called cover crops and this refers to the first goal, to protect our soil from erosion. But it's not the only goal. So this should not be called cover crops, but service crops. Cover is just one of the services provided. What other services are we going to ask from these crops? So we started with this list that uh, includes four services, nutrients capture, which is a concept uh, such as green bridge, bring nutrients from here to a moment further beyond in time to increase carbon and N inputs. How can we manage carbon 
the panel before was talking about climate change. That's one perspective. But locally, we are concerned about organic matter and physical chemical properties of the soils. We should reduce soil compaction. In our soils in Uruguay, we can have a reduced profile for research. They are very differentiated and very heavy. That's why we are so much concerned about compaction. So we have to increase water infiltration. This was the list a few years ago. And currently, we have to contribute to weed management. And if we ask uh, farmers from Uruguay, which is your main concern, and why do you choose a cover crop? Probably number six comes up to number one and relates to this. This is uh, from last year. This is a clover. We have uh, this uh, um, Conisa dominated area. In Brazil is a different weed. This is a regional issue. But the best cover avoided the existence of this issue. Maybe we can quickly list the main uh, characteristics of service crops as we made a list of what we will uh, demand from these crops. See how important consistency is. We needed to band. We needed to seed it in uh, broadcast and at low cost. We have a winter opportunity, so we need uh, it to fix nitrogen, and we have to have, it has to be easy to kill with a herbicide. I told you that annual ryegrass was the dominant cover when we started. But what happened? Well, the same happened in Argentina. The concern about how to kill it, even though it is not Roundup ready, but we have to consider physiology and there's a capacity to become a weed. So what we did when we discussed ryegrass as cover crop, we started to discuss longer cycle varieties so that when I kill them, they are more in a vegetative stage and reacts to herbicide in a different way. We have discussed tetraploid varieties because so far we only have short cycle diploids. There is a moderate use of graze that allows us to justify fertilizers, heavy size, but this grace is very cautious because we have compaction. That's something we discussed this morning. And if we have two grays, we will have low densities so that we don't have many animals together and we will try to use categories that turn into the least possible damage. In Uruguay, basically, we do not graze cover crops. Why oats? There is only one line in red. It is easy to kill. It grows well in winter. So this is a very good option, and it's easy to broadcast it. Let me briefly explain two things. On one side, annual legumes, because we need to fix nitrogen. We have to have an input to the system. And check the red lines. It is uh, difficult to broadcast, see it there, and killing it with a herbicide is a challenge, but this is the main concern. If I don't have early planting, it doesn't grow fast. We are working on Persian clover. We've chosen it because in our soils that are heavy, cold, 
the Persian clover adapts quite well. It is probably the species that we consider a priority. Here we have two examples in cash systems where planting date is very important. It is after soybean, probably 1st of May. Evaluating date is 1st of September. That's the window. So whatever we suggest has to work in this window. These are two different years. 3,000 kilograms of dry matter, 70 to 100 kilograms of N. It's an interesting option, and that's why we are adopting it. Now, what if the clover continues to grow? Well, it explodes. So if I go to late planted corn, the growth rates will be 18 to 20, not actually, but they will come up to 90. A second species that I will mention is this um, biological tilling species. This can produce a deep root system. Broadcast seeded is not what this prefers. And the graph shows that if I plant in March, which cannot be done with the planter after soybean, in 84 days I can reach this amount of root development. But if I plant in June, this doesn't happen. So I have a conflict between planting date and what the species can offer. So very quickly, I'll try to summarize. This works very well. The, uh, these are options we are discussing. Let me close with one concept. And Mir will have his 20 minutes. We are very happy with what we're doing with service crops, and we believe we have to continue working with them. It's been really clear this morning, and something we did with Gervasio last week. If we want to change our systems, it's very difficult to do it only with service crops. We will have to go for perennial pastures. It will be three, four, six years, but perennial pasture will have to be included to reduce erosion and to have this carbon in the roots that will bring fertility to the level it was 15 years ago. This graph shows the rotation experiment started in 1963 showing the worth of pasture in rotations. 50 years of data and you see the organic carbon cycle. This was tillage, conventional tillage, and now it's no till. But it shows that after every pasture cycle, the organic carbon stock increases, and I end up with better levels than starting levels. This can be incredible. If I do continuous agriculture, I will have to handle problems, and I will not reap the benefits of what the slide is showing. So why don't farmers adopt this? Basically, because this requires a high investment. In Uruguay, it's about $1,000 per hectare. Return is lower than with other types of agriculture. It demands infrastructure that many times is not available. It demands labor, and it is not as scalable as modern agriculture. Maybe Sandro that will start doing pasture in La Boulache. It's easier for other farmers that work on leased land. So we have to consider each reality. So when we 
we came to the literal to talk about this, they would say, no, no, don't talk about pasture, let's talk about cover crops. But very intensive systems have started to include pastures to reap benefits of future agricultural cycles. These are my conclusions. Summer winter crop ratio explains the need to include winter cover crops. Oats is the preferred option. It's cheap, reliable, and easy to kill. Since there is no an associated profit, many times we do things that look nice but uh, are not fertilized, do not do weed control. We have increased interest in increasing in inputs. We have to consider what happens under the soil. Somehow, soybean planting and harvest dates leave us a certain window, and if we want to increase fertility, we will only achieve that by increasing perennial crops. So let me now thank those that are here and those who could not come, because this is a joint effort. This is something done in a region. These are needs, specific soils. It is the ponding in the south of Buenos Aires or the south of Cordoba. It's the coal soils in Buenos Aires or some areas in Uruguay where we have the opportunity I mentioned. You can see some people in the picture. So thank you, Ausid. They suggested that I should come here to talk to you. We thank Juan Díaz for his presentation. And we give the floor to Amit Kalegari, who has already been introduced. Well, he has a degree in ag agronomy. He has a degree from Scotland University. He has a PhD in agriculture in the area of soils granted by Londrina University in Brazil and also from Paris University in France and from the Kansas University in the US. He works in the area of soil research with an emphasis on conservation and production. So we give the floor to Mr. Caligari. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy and honored to be here again in Argentina, a wonderful country with beautiful people, with exquisite cuisine. I'd like to apologize for my Spanish. I should speak in English, but I prefer speaking in Spanish. I have to speak fast because I don't have too much time. I, I am here. There are friends from Uruguay and Italy here. Last time we met in Mar del Plata. And I'll start with my presentation. I'd like to thank Epresid and Capas and all of you who create this large audience. I'm not as young as many of you, but I'm try and share with you a message that will be useful, especially for farmers. We're not going to talk about soccer, right? So, in the 70s we have many problems because we're going to talk about green manure, cover crops, but why? In the 70s we had this issue in Brazil, loss of biological quality, chemical, physical and biological features. Look at this area in Brazil. There is a lot of stubble here at the top. I feel deeply moved. I'm sort of frightened. This is a non till Serbian land. This is Pierre Millet. 
excellent cover crop and we are increasing the amount of carbon here we are losing carbon we have problems and I'm going to talk about this in my presentation so what, do the, what does the soil need what does the crop need which are the best environmental conditions for agriculture this varies a lot in your farms there are differences everything depends on the depth on the clay organic matter nutrients rainfall soil life there are many many issues or many elements to be considered this is our non till father the pioneer Herbert Bird and there are several pioneers here Victor Truco and others and there are also pioneers in Uruguay who are encouraging us to use this system. This is Mr. Bath sharing his expertise with Kore some Koreans. So we have the conventional tillage, which was the most important approach to use all over the world. And now we move to non-till. And this is the best thing ever. Well, not yet. In Brazil, we see there are still many changes. Acid soils, intensive farming system, organic matter degradation, we need cover crops, ca crop rotation, there's an overgrazing, there's overgrazing, we have the bare soil, and there is lack of biodiversity. La biodiversidad es biodiversity is a key factor. It is necessary to de create and foster biodiversity. This is a picture from our pioneers in Paraguay. This is a picture of Paraguay, but what is happening now, this is my opinion, in Brazil there are 31 million hectares under no-till, but we have some issues, for example. Uh, the quality of the non-till system soil continuously covered minimum tillage and as many plants as possible the highest population possible so it's necessary to make a diagnosis of all the attributes of the soil and this must be done for each plot, each farm so that we can follow the three principles. Here we have a compact compaction problem. Here we have this will affect the water, the growth of the roots, and it will limit yield. There are nematode problems in Brazil. This is one of the main issues. Some years ago, a Japanese expert came to Brazil and said this is going to be the most important challenge you will be facing Brazil soon, nematodes. And that's the case in one area in Brazil now. I'm not a researcher any longer, but I've been working in 15 states as a consultant. I've been visiting small and large farmers, and 80% of the actors in Brazil has the nematode issue. A serious problem in sugarcane, soya bean, sorghum, different kinds of issues. Some challenges, that, problems that may be caused by nematodes, well, an increase of, an increase in the number of diseases, Rhizoctone and many others, I don't have time to go to explain this at length, but there are, these are serious issues, so nematodes bring about problems so there are more problems and more challenges. And on this slide by Dr. Dr. Clepperton, we can see that the soil quality is very important to reach the balance. We need to take into account biological, chemical, and physical features. And they, uh, this is closely related to soil productivity necessary to produce quality of food, environmental quality, and good soil health, and health for the people. And there are many different plants. I've been working in this field in 1977. 
40 years ago with over 158 different kinds of species and varieties in 49 countries. This rye grass with rye and in the middle we can see some weeds. So it's very important to substitute those crops that may be host for nematodes and replace them by other species. And it strikes me that I haven't seen in the exhibition any green manure representatives. Uh, many of you were in Brazil some years ago, and there are three or four companies that sell about 6,000 tons of seeds for green, green manure. At the back you see Paraguay, this is the Itaipu Dam. Twelve or fourteen years ago I started working with our friends from this area. The over plantation of over sowing of oat. We need to get a good cover crop. In my experience there isn't one one species which is the best one. I think the best species is a mix of crops. Many different species together. Uh, a mix of green manure, but which is the best mix where we need to look at the soil, at the plants, whether it's compaction, if there is a shortage of clay, of, sur of sulfur, if there are diseases, if there is fusarium, etc. So taking all into account, we will choose the best species that will help us to improve the soil profile. These are some species. The first message is we should consider a mix. This is a mix being used in France, the US, Australia, Brazil, and several other countries in the world. Which is the rotation we're going to use? This varies from farm to farm. Sometimes a farm may have five different crop rotation systems, depending on the kind of soil, whether they do cotton farming or not, etc. So, rotations should also differ. We have learned a lot about this. I worked with Dr. Juca Lutense for 26 years, and we learned a lot. Here we have 11 species. We have an expert from the U.S. We had an expert from the U.S. and one from France involved in this trial. They, are all, they all have a wide expertise in this field. We analyzed what happened with these species. We have rice, grass, different kinds of lupinos, and fallow, fallow within, without weeds, and we can see how this influences the following crops of the next crops of wheat and soya bean. Now, carbon sequestration, non till increased carbon sequestration by 1.2 tons. Here we can see the information coming from all the trails and papers, and we can see that well, this is 1986. So this is 31 years ago. Here we have, we have the results after 10 years. This, should, this was the forest after 10 years of cropping without terraces, with a direct conventional till. This was the carbon content of the soil. And this, these squares are the winter fallow. Sorry, I cannot see. <laughs> This is a conventional tillage rotation with winter species. This is a non-till approach with winter fallow. So when we have crop rotation, we are on the 
we are increasing carbon content of the soil. Here you can see non till the carbon that is taken into the soil. You can see fallow, wheat, radish, oat, oats, and lupins. Here we can see the biomass assessed and tested throughout these 19 years. Today we have the information for 30 years. The biomass produced, the roots produced, and the contributions of all of it. And it's all my and I haven't done this all myself. Several students and graduate students from the University in Brazil are contributing to these analysis and tests. Here we see the soil management system, non-tillage and conventional tillage, and the yields are always better with a non-till system. I only have seven minutes left. Well, the light is blinking and telling me I should finish my presentation. So crop rotation. Each of you knows what the best rotation is for your farm and your environment. This is a test we ran, or a pilot we ran with her in the area of Mato Grosso with different rotations. If you ask me, I'm a researcher, I'm a pensioner. As I'm a small farmer, I've always lived in a farm. I like large areas. Working for in small plots is important for a scientific analysis, but you should work in larger surfaces. 1,000 hectares, the soil profile, different combinations of species and the new species. This is a very low plant whose roots go three meters deep. They do excellent physical work and they reduce the number of nematodes. This is a mix of species, sunflower. I worked with this farmer two, work, two weeks ago. This is sunflower, white lupin, pedri has, and black oat, and radish. Why do we have the radish here? Because for 25 years ago, we have known from a university in Sao Paulo that radish is the best species to produce mycorrhiza and black oat as well. So we are, we would plant millet, it wouldn't grow. We would plant oat, it was too hot. So this mix is the best one. We have been using the mixes of two, three, or eight species of cover crop species for over eight years. These are the farmers that own more than 10,000 hectares, grandfather, father, and grandchildren. Here we have Pia Millet, two millets, regular millet, and this is one millet, Crotalaria spectabilis, Crotalaria oculoca, radish, and buckwheat. Crucifers are the best ones to attract sulfur. Canola, mustard, crumby, crumby, absilica are the best ones to attract nitrogen and phosphorus. Sunflower at 2 kilograms, they don't achieve anything. You need to reduce the number of nematodes and you need to capture nitrogen from the air. And millet provides a good cover crop and it has good roots. And millet is the best plan to recycle potassium. 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 Potash, sorry. So the, each plant has a specific role to play, and when we put them all together, we get the best results. This is a 30,000 hectares farm belonging to the Mormons. Look at the millet here. This was planted by oversowing on the soya bean 
crop. It's very good for animals because it reduces the number of nematodes and it works with potash, nit nitrate, and sulfur leave with the rainfall and you have to get them back and we do this by using the right species. This is a project which is being developed in Brazil currently. It's called Solo Vivi living soil. Here we see the mix of cover crops or cover species. This is a picture of a plot. These are not roots, they are mycorrhiza. In the last three years, the microorganisms that have been most studied in the world are the mycorrhiza. There is a researcher in the U.S. who is focusing on this especially, and they have found that by increasing the mycorrhiza, there were more walls, more carbon, and more yield, more quality with lower inputs. Look at the monocrotaline nematodes, 70 or 80 percent of them are attractive, so this reduces the reproduction rate. So nematodes, well, we need to go against them, but we need to know the species accurately. This is a paper by Kelly Gary, an expert in nematodes, where we see the effects of different species. We know that the best approach is always to use the right crop rotation. This farmer has been or has over 9,000 hectares. They had different problems. They started using cover crops. They started using biological products. So here you see the clover which is excellent for the soil and here we see a researcher telling us feed the soil not the crop this has been our approach for 20 years now so we need a holistic approach we should feed the soil not the plant the soil will feed the plant itself this is a paper by Herbert Bartz working in the north of Paraná in Brazil, con trying to control nematodes using cover crops. This is what is being done in Mato Grosso with maize or corn as a cover crop, and this buckwheat is excellent. Japan and China are importing this grain. It grows very quickly. The root may go two meters down and it produces lots of mycorrhiza. What happened here? The Coniza bonariensis tried to attack this crop, but if you have a good cover crop, it cannot prosper. There you see what is happening. Entonces, señor, acá tenemos en Araponga, norte de Paraná. Opa, oh, sorry. Aquí tenemos. Here have six or seven different species: oat, right, lupin, etc. And this is a revolution. Yesterday we had a workshop with 86 farmers, and I would consult with my trainers. So or my mentors, so that we could all work together to improve yields with fewer inputs. So in non-till, we need to use crop rotation. But what is rotation? It's a sequence. No, it's using green manure or green fertilizer. Which is the best fertilizer? Well, we need to talk to the soil to increase all these elements in the soil to have more fungi, more macrorhiza fungi to improve the ecosystem in the soil. And this will enable us to improve the quality, the overall quality. This is a picture taken last year. This farmer planted. Look at the stubble. There was a 
drought, but it grew, but the crops were able to grow too because of the amount of stubble. This is not a chess plot. This was done in the fields. Last week I worked with a farmer that owns 240,000 hectares. We were talking about nematodes. What to do with his cotton crops, soya bean crops, and increase productivity. So they're going to use cover crops to help them out and use rotation wherever it can be used. So they may, you may do crops, cattle farming, cover crops. Oh, what about the nodulation? What are we doing in the case of soya bean nodulation? Well, we should use different tools here too. We need to develop a more intelligent agriculture. And this is very interesting information. This was published a short time ago. This is, relates to the Mato Grosso. This is kilograms of soya bean per hectare. You can see 5,000 kilograms here. Look at the difference with the average he yield he had in the past. This is another farmer who harvested corn, nine tons per hectare without bioactivation. And while there was cover crop, oat, visia, and lupino, there were 12 tons, three more tons of yield per hectare. So with the right cover crop, you may increase yields. This is soya bean, again, higher yields. This is information from Rio Grande do Sur, where we have a mix of cover species. We, and all the farmers in this region have increased their yield. This is information from Tokyo, and this uh, soil which has 70% of clay. Here they use 100 kilograms of P, here only 40 on the right, and the yield was again higher. So the yield does not depend on the amount of P, but on the amount of life in the soil. This is again information from Brazil. Here there is a balance of nutrients, and I'm going to tell you something very quickly. Many of the speakers that took the floor before me are experts on carbon sequestration, but I've been working in Sao Paulo for 12 years in sugarcane plantations. After 12 years, with 12 tons of dry matter on the soil and the uh, roots, they analyze the roots every year. And after 12 years, do you know what happened with the dry matter in 12 years? Nothing. There was not an increase in the amount of dry matter, nor, nor the amount of carbon in the soil. People were discussing, exchanging ideas, and a colleague of mine asked, is the soil alive? Come on, alive, why? Because it's not alive. Many microorganisms were killed and was, the soil was compacted, so it wasn't able to sequester carbon, so it was losing carbon. And you know that the microbiology, the microbiota, is very important to increase carbon sequestration rates. We have to increase, expand the life of the soil. In order to do that, we need to expand the biodiversity, quality, not only quantity, quality especially. I have still a couple minutes. This is the United States, Argentina, Africa. These are all experiences that we have uh, conducted. This is France, where we took this mix of uh, crops, the number and the amount of nutrients. This is Ukraine. We don't know anything about Russian only Spasiva, Zhenitsa. This was presented today, Yellow Sweet Clover, a perennial clover that is fantastic. 
we have to move forward. This is Portugal, Italy, Australia. This is with friends. We've been there many times. Great people. We are not going to discuss their system in China. This is Africa. A native legume increase a hundred percent the production of roots and rice production increased. So we are going to finish paying an homage to this man, our dear friend Shiro Miyasa Miyasaka. This is Shiro Miyasaka. He is the father of green cover in Brazil. He worked for 40 years with soybean. And this is the end of my presentation. Let me tell you, this is Juca. This is good for no tillage system, but uh, the soil being alive is the crucial point. Biodiversity and happy life. Thank you very much. Le agradecemos a Demir Calgari por su presentación. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we have Gustavo Piñeiro to close the panel. So we are a little bit uh, delayed, more than delayed, late. I think uh, you presented more slides than anybody in 20 minutes. You deserve a Guinness record. It's been very motivating, a good pep talk. We have some interesting questions. If I had to summarize the two talks, the strongest message is to mix. Think about different services. Many species do not stick to one. Because here in Argentina, we basically plant one species. Mixing species is the most important message. Juani, your experience in Uruguay is very interesting, how Uruguay has evolved. And those lists that Juani presented, what we demand from cover crops and what services they can provide. I think that's the idea to start organizing the system in a different way. It is not only what we harvest, but also those other components of the system. And there's a long list. And probably the different species we can use is really important. Many species, we think it's complicated, but I believe we should create systems that are a bit complex but simple to manage. Many times systems and management correlate in terms of difficulty, but we have to move towards complex systems with simple management. That is what we have to think about, complex systems with simple management. Okay, I have some questions that are very specific. I don't know if you want to add anything. So, since we have uh, taken 10 minutes of the break, thank you very much, and I hope this has... Um,